coming back to school with me We could have done it all so easily Hi, my name is Craig Thompson Wood. I'm your host on Teaching with Board Games here today to take a look at Cora Quest by Cora and Dan Hughes. Now, way, way back when I first started this channel, it was the first year I'd done the channel, the first couple months I'd done the channel, I think it was even like in the second month, I had done an episode about Father's Day, uh, because that was the year I'd actually, my dad had passed away in that year, and I wanted to do a little tribute to the man who had introduced me to board games at a young age, my father, and by doing, do, did that by t uh, highlighting different fathers who were on YouTube with their children. And one of the people I had mentioned at that time was Cora and Dan Hughes and their channel and what they did for the Dice Tower and what they still do for the Dice Tower. Um, fast forward now a few years later and they have kickstarted and put out this game called Cora Quest. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first take you to the table. I'm going to change things up a little bit now. I'm going to take you to the table, show you how the game is set up, show you a little bit about how the game is played, and then I'll take you to the report card afterwards. So let's take it to the table. So these are the components that you're going to get with your set of Cora quests. You're going to get, the, this is the quest book, which you will use to set up for the pre-made quests. You can always make up your own quests. Uh, there are dungeon tiles, which I'll explain in just a little moment. This is the starting dungeon tile, the rule book. You get um, different types of cards for different types of loot that you get. Uh, I've set up monster cards for the mission. This is a timer to see if, if you're not exploring enough, then these spiders are going to come. And I will explain that in a little bit. There are blank cards here for making your own um, items that you can add into the decks. So those already been pre-made for you. Treasure chests, and then you have your heroes here. Every game is going to have four heroes playing. So even if you're playing with less than four people, then each one person or more than one person is going to control more than one hero. And then there's health dials for each of the heroes. There is wound tokens here. And these are wound tokens, as I said. And this is a monster dial. So for big monsters, that's their, their dial. So in this one, the big monster would be this giant snake here. Now, it should be noted that these stickers, which I have here, come with only with the, the our Kickstarter exclusive. So you're only going to get these if you have the Kickstarter or if you buy the Kickstarter edition from somebody, if they are foolish enough, foolish enough to sell theirs. This is a how to customize. Going to uh, the creator. There's an app here where you can do that. You can create your own stuff. And I will not be looking so much at this, but just showing you that this kind of thing is available. All right, let's get to setting up the game. So for your game of Korra Quest, you're always going to start off with the dungeon tile number one. They always tell you that what you're going to do for, depends on the length of game you want. So for your standard length game, you're taking cards two to 13 and the cards have little numbers in the bottom um, corners. So you have, I have here two all the way up to 13. You're going to shuffle those up and you're going to make them into four piles. So it should be three cards per pile. So one, two, three, four, and I'm just putting those into the four piles. And this is going to help to make sure that these ones here, so these are the, um, the for part of the story uh, are going to be the cards that sort of move the story along. So they are separated, so this way you're not getting them all one right after the other. I mean, I guess it's possible to get one and then the next one next because one could be in this pile and one's going to be in this pile. But you start off with A, B, C, and D. And so I'll shuffle up my Ds first. All right, and then my Cs go on top of that. So this, remember the C is somewhere here. So that's the card C. No, that's number eight. There's C. So that's C. Okay, and that goes on top. So, and then B, the card the pile with card B is going to go on top of that and then the pile with card A is going to go on top of that all right so that's off to one side now we put this torch on top of it this torch indicates when you have explored and that's going to be an important thing to know so uh, as I say this is all explained here in the thing so I'm looking at the first mission here called fangs for the memories so it tells me that I'm using the, the story tiles A B C and D 
in with there. And the monsters I'm using are orcs, goblins, gremlins, spiders, and the giant snake. So I have orcs, goblins, gremlins, giant snake, and then the spiders are back there. They have the story here, but you can also go to the Korra Quest website and have Dan Hughes read it to you, which given some of the language in the story, it's very sort of British language. So I, I kind of like listening to it that way for me saying some of the things in there it just doesn't sound quite as right as when Dan does. And Dan has a lovely voice. So that is the basic setup. So now the heroes are going to begin in the starting tile here. So I'll just put the four heroes in here and you begin. So for each hero's turn, you're going to have a certain number of actions that you can be doing. So you can take as many free actions which you, as you want. Free actions are revealing new dungeon tiles which are adjacent to your current position or using items you have which you've located from treasures that you can use such as drinking potions and such. Then you can take up to two full actions in your turn. Full actions include moving, searching treasure chests, swapping with other party members, reviving, which is recovering from a stunned condition, which um, is a special rule, and then attacking. So you can do two of those in a turn. And then you go into the enemy phase where the enemy is going to also take two actions. They can attack, or if they can't attack, they're going to move. And when they attack, they attack somebody that they can attack and if there's a, you know, they'll attack the closest. And two models are the closest, well, the heroes get to decide who goes. And then you're going to do a countdown phase where you're refreshing the heroes. Hero tokens will be on this countdown thing as well. So the heroes each have a token here which when they use their special abilities, it goes onto the two and then they start to refresh and when it comes back off the board, then they can use it again. This countdown phase here is for if you did not search anything and you'll know because the, you didn't search anything because this, this torch token is still on top of the deck, then this thing of spiders moves down. And then if you don't search again in a future turn, then it comes right off. And then when that happens, every tile which has spider webs, and you can see, um, maybe it's a little hard to see, let me move these off. But every, there's some of the sp uh, tiles have spider webs on them. And for every tile that has spider webs, you're going to put a spider onto that spider web. Now, one thing I should mention too, is that every character starts with an item specific to them. So these are the ones with the, the gloves on the back. These are your starting items. So sword girl starts with a sword. Spear woman starts with a spear. I mean, go figure. Dwarf starts with an ax. And then halfling starts with a catapult. Not a slingshot, a catapult. Dan Hughes assures me that it is a catapult. And so those are their starting items. And they're going to tell you too the range. So you see like the axe is a range of one. So it has to be adjacent to be used. Whereas the catapult can be up to four spaces away. So that's part of the benefit of the halfling. So let me walk you through a turn here to show you how this would go. So when starting the quest, uh, you go to the corequest.com website and you can get the rules, but I'm just looking for the quest narration. So I'm going to click that button there. Make sure my volume is nice and loud. Okay, and then from this screen, you're just going to scroll up and you're going to find the quest that you want narrated by Dan. So there's a whole bunch of quests here. So we're just doing the first one. So we're going for Fangs for the Memories. So I click that. My phone's being a little bit slow. We'll do the introduction. Fans for the memories. Introduction. Wizard Pebbledash calls you over. He looks very worried. Though, no, my gnome assistants, Kevin and Annabelle, went into Hunter's dungeon to look for a new pet, he tells you. But it's nearly bedtime now, and they're still not home. Oh, they're not very good assistants, he says. And they never cleaned my spoon collection properly, but, but I'm quite fond of them, really, and, and I'd hate for them to be in any danger. Oh, could you find them for me? You decide you will help Wizard Pebble Dash find Kevin and Annabelle. After all, how much trouble could a couple of gnomes have gotten themselves into? All right, so that's the introduction. We're looking for the two gnomes in this dungeon. Now, the start of the hero's turn. So remember we have those free actions, which were on the card here. 
that show us what we can do. So free actions, revealing a tile. So revealing a new dungeon tile is free. Now, what's as I say important, when you reveal a dungeon tile, you take this off the dungeon tile deck to indicate that you have searched this turn. And that's a really interesting, it's a neat little mechanic just to help remind you that you have indeed searched that turn. So you draw the first card off of the dungeon tile deck and you have to line it up in such a way that it's going to now I could like um, like the halfling was the one looking here so in here I, I can't put it where pardon the glare here but let me just remove everybody here and show you so I couldn't put it like this because then I have this wall touching the thing there it has to be able to adjust touch so it's like that or like that so let's just let's just put it like that then and these two were here and these two were up here now on this tile it also indicates that there's a treasure chest and there's these two green spaces here with three bones now monsters are going to be represented by the bones so which monster is it is by the number of bones the more bones the more dangerous they are so we've just found two of the most dangerous ones the orcs so the three bones there so two orcs are here and they will be in those positions shown so there'll be one here and one here, and then we're going to put a treasure chest here. So now the that was the no that was the halfling's free action. So this halfling still has two actions that can be taken. So might as well try to attack. Now the halfling has a ranged attack, but the the, the orc is right next to him. So he's just going to have to see what he can do with about that. So rolling the dice, he gets one hit. So we're going to take one wound and put it on the orc. Now orcs will take three wounds in order to be killed and they can move three spaces and attack with two red dice so they're quite deadly but they also only can attack things which are adjacent to them um so you know what then i think then the halfling is going to attack the one in the back the halfling will shoot the one in the back because sword girl is going to hope to finish this one off i think that's the better strategy because sword girl can only attack things which are adjacent to her whereas the halfling can shoot at range so hopefully sword girl can kill this one so Wow, and so the halfling just did two damage to the one in the back, so that one is in a lot of trouble. So the halfling did some really good work there. So that was the halfling's turn. So the halfling did his free action of reveal, and then took two actions, which were attack and attack. So now we go to another hero. So we will go with... Um, we will go with... Uh, let's see, we'll, we'll, we'll go with Sword Girl. Sword Girl is going to attack, so she also attacks one red, one white. All the heroes are going to have one red, one white for attack. At least that I've noticed. I don't know if there's anything different. And she misses with the first attack completely. Now, when you miss with an attack completely, what you do is you can flip the card over and you get this determined side. This is determined, and you see now, instead of a red, you get, instead of just a red plus your weapon, you get red, white plus a weapon, so you, get, you can get an extra white dice. Um, now let's just sort of look too at these things. I didn't mention these before, but so they have each character has a special ability. So she and one adjacent hero become determined, and this means this is determined. So you get that bonus dice for your attack. And once you have hit, then you become back to your normal side. So that she can help people to become determined. The dwarf can move and attack for one action. The halfling can choose to take no damage from an attack. And Spearwoman, after rolling an attack, she can choose one of the dice to become a result of her choice. Now, when you do that, then on the countdown, that's where you put your tokens down. So if Spearwoman was to use that ability, then she would put her thing up there on the two. And after the first turn, after the next turn, it would come down to the one, and then the next turn it comes off, and then she can use it again. But until it comes off that countdown chart, she's not allowed to use it. So it's not like he can use them every turn, because that would be a little bit powerful. So Sword Girl has missed, so she's determined, but she still gets a second attack, and now she's determined, so she's going to add an extra white dice into the attack. Now, if she misses again, she just stays determined. It's not like she becomes ultra-determined or anything. And boom, boom, boom. Now she gets two hits. And two hits is sufficient to kill the orc. So she has killed that orc. There is no special loot drops or anything for when you kill monsters. It's just you have to get rid of them because they're going to hurt you if you don't. So that is her turn done. So now, um, if the orc were to move, 
it could only move and then attack once. Because remember, it gets two actions. So it's not going to... But with only one wound left, I don't think we're that worried anymore. So Spear Girl is going to come up here. So for one action, she's going to move. And then for another action... Oh, now Sword Girl did hit, hit, hit. So I'm going to turn that back to that side. So Spear Girl is going to attack. She gets one red, one white. And she gets one hit, which is sufficient to kill the orc. So she has killed the orcs. The orcs are all gone, which means then... Dwarf can spend one action to move up to here, and then Dwarf will search the treasure chest. So searching the treasure chest, Dwarf pulls up an item, and it is a Warhammer. So a Warhammer has a range of one, and single-handed, and it does two white dice. So Dwarf found it, and Warhammer sounds like something a Dwarf would use anyway. So we will give the dwarf the warhammer. And we'll just discard that other item. So now dwarf has a warhammer to use. And that would be the first round. So at this point, we go into... So we've had all the characters do their um, hero phase. We look at the enemy phase. There are no enemies on the board. We go into the countdown phase. So we refresh all the heroes. We refresh all the heroes, um, move hero tokens down the countdown track, but nobody's hero went on the countdown track, so we don't need to do that. The explorer marker is not on the deck. The explorer marker came off. The explorer marker is down here because we did explore. So we don't move down the threat token. And so we are good. So we are going to go on to the next turn. So for the next turn then, um, we will and we can choose anybody we want to start the turn so maybe we'll have um maybe we'll have sword girl take a turn first and sword girl is going to take a turn and she is going to start off i think as always really so actually during your refresh phase one thing you really need to make sure of is you put the token back on top just again to remind you so sword girl when she takes her turn is going to explore so i'm going to remove that token and pull it up and up look at there it's actually a so A will come here. So you can't have it where it's uh, the tile is touching, you know, halfway in between tiles or anything. So it's just you line them up edge to edge on the tiles and it's there. Now being that it's A and it's a letter, it's not a number, then we would go to the next one here. So we go to card A. Story card A. You find an abandoned gnome size backpack on the floor. And you recognize it as belonging to Annabelle. In the backpack are three... Okay, and no more spoilers. You have to play this yourself. I'm not going to spoil the story for you, but this is just what's going to happen. You keep going through, you're exploring, you're doing all these things and um, finding the pieces that you need to eventually get to the end and defeat the final boss, which in this case is the giant snake. Through the game, uh, the, I say, like I said, the important things are to constantly be remembering to be searching every turn because the last thing you want is to be adding spiders on top of everything else that's going on there to be dealing with because it is it's already a really tough game and i there's actually even so this is like the giant spider uh, sorry giant snake at the end so 14 wounds but there's even like a tough mode this is tough snake so there's the they have tougher so you can have the orcs who are three and three with two red dice or you can have tough orcs who are four and three with two red dice i couldn't imagine the, the tough mode because timothy and i barely made it out in that first game it was really challenging so maybe with more experience and things but it definitely a lot of strategy a lot of fun and so the game goes on until you make it to the end and you beat the final boss or one of the heroes dies at the point that even one of the heroes dies the game is over the heroes have lost so you have to make sure that you work together to prevent that from happening and game continues until one of those two things happens heroes win or the heroes lose let me take you to the report card and tell you what I think about this game. All right, so in looking at Cora Quest from a, a report card perspective then, I'm going to give the number of pay players a B plus. My standard for a B is between two to four players. This plays one to four players. And I always like that option for the solo play. And it's a cooperative game. So, I mean, any cooperative game is going to have opportunities for solo play. Uh, well, I can't think of an exception right now, but there may be one. But this one definitely can play between one to four players. And so for that little bit of 
extra, I give it a little bit of extra to a B plus. For learning, I'm actually going to give this game an A, which I had to think about for a while. I was thinking about how I was going to grade this one, and then I was sort of went up and down and way back up again to the A. Not because of the content that it holds, that it's it's really teaching you amazing things in the game. I mean, it has some things in there about reading, and it has math and probabilities and things like that. That's, uh, but there's more to it than that. When you look at an A, an A is exceptional. And what is exceptional about this game is the story behind it. Uh, Core Quest was designed by Cora and Dan Hughes during COVID, when Dan was seeing that the homework that was coming home with Cora, or the during the lockdown times and things, he just felt it wasn't as much as he would have liked and felt there was more that he, you know, could have been done. No, no fault to the teachers. I mean, we were all scrambling during those first few months when it had first hit. It was just, we weren't, it took us a while to adjust to the new expectations and everything. But he just felt that he wanted to do some more. So he thought, well, let's let's just try designing a game together. They were creating a game. I mean, there's actually going to be an interview with Dan coming up next week. Um, which he'll explain more about the process, how this all happened. But needless to say, as they were doing this, he was doing it partially to help her with these different things, the concepts that are in there, the reading, the writing, the math, the art, all the subject areas that come together to creating a board game. And so that was part of his motivation behind this. So I love that story behind it. I love the fact that that was there. But now with this game, I mean, while you're playing it, yes, like I said, there are, there is reading, there is math, there is art involved in it because, but there's also the opportunity, what they have to create your own things. And they really encourage that. They have blank cards in there. They have a website dedicated to creating your own things. So this game is going to really inspire some kids to, to do more, to create more, and to maybe even the story of, hey, we kickstarted a game together. I mean, this could be inspiration for some people who are, are that adventurous. I'm not saying be that adventurous, because I mean, I can't uh, imagine all the work that goes into kickstarting a game, but you can add to this game by creating your own art for it, and getting, your, well, getting your kids to do that, and getting these students or children to do that kind of thing, creating their own art, creating their own characters, creating their own quest. There's like all this information in here on how to do that. So it's really a game I can't recall where I've seen a game that is so involved in getting um, community content added to it like this one. So I think that's absolutely amazing. And so to me, that's what really pushes into that A category. Because like as I said, it makes an op uh, awesome opportunity, particularly if you're homeschooling or something, to give the kids the kind of um, challenge and inspiration to do such things. For fun, I'm going to give the game an A. I thought that the game was really quite amazing. Uh, it's, 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 it's a difficult thing. It kind of reminds me of Sesame Street. Now bear with me with my little analogy here. It reminds me of Sesame Street because in Sesame Street, it's, Sesame Street was a great show because it was for the kids. I mean, it had a lot of educational things and fun, fun things for the kids, but they had sometimes some jokes that kind of slid in there that was like, that's for the adults. You know, adults will get that one. The kids won't get it. Nothing, nothing rude or, you know, adult humor or anything like that. But it was, it was jokes which were obviously going to be above the kids heads but it was amusing for the adults so and that's the kind of thing this game i mean it's a kid's game it's not a you know an adult dungeon call if you want an adult dungeon call there's many other dungeon call games out there like descent and super dungeon explorer all kinds of games but this one is more for the kids but you're going to be playing with adults probably as a family or something and so being a kid's game you know accessible by children it's also got enough there there's enough meat to the game there's enough content there's enough challenge to the game that it's also very interesting for adults uh, timothy and i played this game together already and um wow it was it was something else i mean we, we had a really good time there was uh, this constant pressure of having to search and things and the uh, near the end, I mean, all our characters were down to their last wounds, and like it, we were just like by the razor's edge, did we win our game? So yeah, I definitely think that that's a, a, a difficult balance to strike to be making a game which is for children but still interesting to adults. So well done. For time, I'm going to give the game a B. 
Uh, it says it plays up to, like, it says 45 minutes is a suggested game time on the box. Now, it's going to take a bit to set up and clean up because there's a lot of different cards and dice and character stands and blah, blah, blah. So the setup and cleanup is going to be a bit um, of a, a, a task. But overall, I mean, it's it not a game which I, you know, overstays its welcome. Some games, you know, you're playing it, you're like, okay, is this game going to be over soon? Or... It may be over too quickly. I think, I think this game kind of hits that sweet spot in there that it's, it's uh, it plays just sort of the right amount of time. Uh, I wouldn't be suggesting this game for a classroom, so I'm not worried about the time you'd be playing you know, within a class period. I, I don't think so. And um, board game club, maybe, but definitely something that you'd be wanting to keep control, of, like watching carefully over, because there are so many pieces and parts to this game that you don't want to be just leaving kids to their own devices with it. It'll be ruined in no time so b for time and for cost i don't know yet uh this was a kickstarter copy like i said i kickstarted the game when um it came out like last year and dan was actually excellent with the whole kickstarter process the, the it was very smooth it was very well organized it was um well communicated and things kind of came out on time i think one of the big things that uh, my experience with kickstarters has taught me is if you're going to kickstart a game don't do miniatures this game has cardboard standees and things uh, for the characters and the monsters and i think that helps you know um and also the the, the it's beautiful that the characters are um standees because as you can see you know look at the drawing there they're actually drawn by kids from around the world I mean, Cora drew some of them, but there's other kids who contributed to the art of this game, and I think that's absolutely amazing. That's one of the things I love most about this game, like I said, is the community contribution that went into this and continues to go into it. So, um, I'm not sure how much it's going to cost once it comes out, but we'll see. And um, so, reserving judgment on that, but I think it's a, a wonderful little game and one that you should be thinking about getting when it becomes available. Okay, so that kind of wraps it up for the report card then. Let me take you to my final thoughts. So Core Quest, as I said, is not a game that I would be looking at for a classroom. Um, I, I would not even want to include this one in my board game club at school because uh, I guess there's just too many things going on there. The kids have enough other games that we could be playing that I don't want this one to go there. Uh, not only because it's a Kickstarter copy. I mean, the fact that it's a Kickstarter copy definitely makes me not want to because if I lose anything then it's pretty irreplaceable right now and like I said they've got enough other games and things I just don't think they need this one uh, if, if they want co-ops and things I've got those kind of things this this is a game I'm going to keep at home I'm going to enjoy this game with Timothy and the other grandkids and um, so th this one is, is staying here with me so I'm I couldn't be happier with the whole pr the whole product because like I said I was a fan of Dan and Cora from the first time I've been seeing them on the Dice Tower uh, to the fact that they had this great idea to do a game like this to the fact that they then want to share this with the world and they started kickstarting it and to the fact that now it's here and it's a great game so I like I said cheers all around this is this is fantastic and um, if you're, like I said, if you're homeschooling, I would highly recommend this game. Or if you have kids at home, uh, you know, I, I would, again, highly recommend this game. Big time approval, big time recommendations for me. So if you're new to the channel, then what I'm doing is I'm putting out content on a weekly basis uh, around topics of gamification, game-based learning, where I'm talking about how we can use games and the power of games to help us to learn things because it's more fun to learn when we're doing it in the form of a game. And I'm a teacher with the Peel District School Board in Brampton, Ontario, Canada, and have been doing that for over 20 years now. And to make this a big part of my own personal pedagogy and want to share that with you, the viewer. If you have any ideas for games you might like to see on the channel or ideas and topics for discussion, then please leave me a message in the comments section below. Do love to hear from the viewers as it helps me to give you relevant content. And while you're down there, please don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button. It really does help my channel and I really do appreciate it and don't forget to hit that little bell icon too to indicate when the new content is coming out which like I said is on a weekly basis and that is going to wrap it up for today's episode until next time I am Craig Thompson Wood your host on teaching with board games saying thanks for coming to the classroom are you coming back to school with me